Hello and welcome. Earth provides a rare opportunity for fire to exist, at least in our solar system. Oxygen has been providing the oxidizer for combustion to take place since the great oxygenation events 1 to 2 billion years ago. Trees have been supplying the fuels for over 400 million years. Volcanoes and lightning are the usual natural source of ignition. And this is a normal part of the life cycle on this planet. Except now, and for the last 200,000 years, people are in the way. Like clockwork, every summer brings the expected devastation the Earth is familiar with and people dread. The recent Canadian wildfires of August 2025 created air quality alert all over North America and climate change only increased the frequency and scale of this uh, natural occurrence. Why would a distant fire generate so much mayhem? The environment is full of complex molecules, I explore some of them in the GCMS video here. But uh, the heating and burning process of the vegetation breaks down large molecules and releases simpler ones called volatile organic compounds or VOC. Some of them are not exactly healthy to breathe in or ingest. Because hot air is more buoyant than cold air, these molecules along with fine particulates can and are being carried to high altitude and picked up by atmospheric current like the jet stream. This map shows the area of concern from the remote west to the east coast of America, including the Great Lakes, where I reside. So I thought this was a nice opportunity to analyze this air for VOC content by simply extracting them from my HVAC filter. I first took a look at the filter itself under a microscope. This was installed at the end of winter, sometimes late March, early April. The fine particulates from the fire are very small. This is a cat hair for size comparison. The fibers form this complex matrix able to catch these lighter colored particles. These are mostly dirt and sand. You see, I live on the dirt road. A lot of dust is kicked off when the road is dry. These smaller, darker particles probably pollen from earlier in the summer and spring. The particles we are looking for are much smaller and it's uh, getting difficult to tell what these are. Could be anything. So to get a better idea, I had to analyze this mess for possible VOCs. This is the same process I described in many previous videos. The filter is soaked in dichloromethane, so all the soluble compound migrate from the filter support to the liquid. Because water could be present, and to remove some solid, I filter the solvent on anhydrous sodium sulfate. This is then evaporated, adding more VOC to the atmosphere in the process. The concentrate is then injected in my GCMS for analysis. This is my uh, dichloromethane alone, showing a pretty clean blank. The filter added all these interesting compounds. This here is xylene. There is also acetic acid. And this little guy here is trioxane. Because I set my mass spectrometer to look at mass from uh, 50 to 400, I will uh, not be able to see formaldehyde at mass 28, 29, and 30. Formaldehyde is a gas with a tendency to polymerize with itself and can form trioxane, which is a solid. With the confidence factor in the mid-90s, I am uh, pretty sure formaldehyde made it through this filter at some point. But how could I tell if this is a component from the wildfire? This paper indicates the likely concentration of all these molecules according to the type of vegetation burning in three different climates. Formaldehyde is present in all of them. Interestingly, the xylene isomer are not all represented. The mass spectrometer cannot identify isomer like parrot, ortho, and methazylene, but the GC can. That's the power of the GCMS combination. You might say there is many sources of trioxane, p-xylene, and acetic acid in the urban air where I live, and you'd be right. So again, how could I be sure these are from the Canadian fires? Honestly, I can't. But I can analyze another filter again in a few months and compare the results. And I can look at the isotopic ratio of oxygen 18 in the trioxane. You see, the further north you go, the more oxygen 18 gets depleted in the environment. Because of its two extra neutrons, oxygen 18 tends to evaporate slower than oxygen 16 when incorporated in the water molecule. Water containing oxygen 18 in vapor form will be the first to fall from the storm. This phenomenon makes the ocean richer in oxygen 18 and the polar ice depleted in that isotope. 
Since the fires are burning in higher latitude than mine, I should be able to see a lower concentration of oxygen-18 than expected if the detected trioxin was from my immediate surrounding. Of course, in reality, this is a bit more tricky than that, but you get the idea. This isotopic depletion was discovered and studied by the not famous enough, in my opinion, Harold Urey, who deserve way more credit for his vast contribution to many scientific disciplines. The discovery of deuterium? Harold Urey. The gaseous diffusion enrichment process of uranium during the Manhattan Project? Harold Urey. The primordial amino acid experiment? Stanley Miller, a student of and working with? Harold Urey. Helping Enrico Fermi get established in the US during World War II? Harold Urey again. Almost discovering protactinium just a little too late. Harold Urey, a great man who deserved to be recognized indeed, but I digress again. I use Mass Interpreter for this uh, quick look at isotopic ratio. It's a free software, believe it or not, but a very powerful one. I just export my spectrum to the library, select the correct molecule and import it to Mass Interpreter. Here I can look at each peak for the section of fragmented molecule. And if I select the correct fragment, the peak is highlighted here. I can then look at the expected mass and compare with the one I measured in Excalibur. Even if my calibration is not perfect, I am just looking at the ratio between molecule fragment, so my setup doesn't really matter. But uh, trust me, it's, it's fine. Now I can compare this ratio with the accepted one from MS Interpreter and see if there is any differences. In a larger and more complicated molecule, I could pinpoint the exact segment likely to contain a rare isotope, but for triax in here, it doesn't really matter since the molecule is very symmetrical. So the expected total mass for this trioxin is 89, with additional peak expected at 90 and 91. So one might be the carbon-13, and the other is either oxygen-18 or 2-carbon-13, or carbon-13 and a deuterium, but those are extremely rare events, so uh, let's not worry about that now. The expected carbon-13 excess is only 0.11% off the theoretical value, but the oxygen-18 shows a difference of 0.45%. This trioxin is somewhat slightly depleted in oxygen-18, is what I'm saying here. This makes sense, considering the time of the year and the latitude of the suspected origin of this uh, trioxin slash formaldehyde. Finally, oxygen-18 has been studied as a forensic method to determine the severity of a wildfire. I know I'm pushing the limits of uh, what an older GCMS can do, but this is so much fun, I couldn't help to share it, and I hope you enjoyed it too. Oh yeah, real quick, I am uh, obviously not 100% on this analysis, but I think it gives a decent overview of the phenomenon and what's going on. Also, I've been trying to set up this LCMS for a while now, and I've had mixed results so far, but I will share my result as soon as I get something decent worth watching. So thank you again for your continued support. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Oh, and uh, remind me to show you the lab at some point. So, this is probably not your first YouTube video, and you know what to do. Thumbs up if you like it, subscribe if you want, Patreon, bell, share. I hope to see you again on the next one, and thank you for watching.